The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. An entire family exposed to COVID-19, or office group, or class. Almost everyone gets sick, but one person never does. Tonight, the curious case of those who seem to be naturally resistant to this pandemic. Then, although the Toronto Raptors may be out of contention for this year, former Raptor Muggsy Bogues joins us on how his career made space for small ball in pro basketball. It's Monday, May 2nd, and that's coming up on The Agenda. Some people simply don't catch COVID-19. It's not that they're immune or that they fight it off without difficulty. It's that even with direct exposure, they don't get the virus. Why? Let's ask. In Montreal, Quebec, Dr. Donald Vinn, infectious disease physician and associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill University. And in Hamilton, Ontario, Don Bowdish, immunologist and professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University and Matthew Miller, Professor of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences, also at McMaster University. Welcome everyone to the program. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Thank you. All right, so I want to start by reading you a quote from Dr. Daniela J. Lamas, a pulmonary and critical care physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, writing in the New York Times. Since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic in March of 2020, scientists and health workers have learned a tremendous amount about the coronavirus. The uncertainty and fear of that first spring have given way to clear evidence for how best to treat those who fall ill. We understand routes of transmission, and in the United States, we are lucky to have access to effective vaccines and testing. Many of us are fortunate to lead lives that are no longer so limited by this virus. But why some people do not become sick despite significant exposure remains a mystery, one of the most important of the pandemic. So Don, I'm gonna start with you. Is this one of the important questions or mysteries of the pandemic? Absolutely. I mean, as an immunologist, one of the things we really like to learn from in these very, very rare people who seem to be resistant is what features of their immune system are protective. What features can we then harness and move into new vaccines? I do think it's important to set the bar appropriately. The vast majority of people who don't get COVID-19 don't get it because they're either following the public health measures, uh, they've been vaccinated, or they've been lucky. So determining people who are truly resistant is by far a minority. And as well as the variants change, Change, that also changes that risk ratio. Somebody who might have had some protective immunity towards the earlier variants may not necessarily be protected from Omicron. So it's really important for people to know that just because they've managed to get this far without getting COVID doesn't mean they're going to go forever and they should still follow all our public health measures and absolutely be vaccinated. On that note, Donald, how typical or normal is it to see people exposed to COVID-19 who don't become sick? I think we've heard every anecdote possible about stories of people who have fallen extremely ill and there is a family member who somehow miraculously did not. How often or how typical is that? Well, it's hard to give you an accurate estimate simply because we just don't know, right? Um, on the other hand, anecdotally, from the first waves, I, I can tell you from personal experience um, that, you know, we would often see people who were hospitalized with COVID, even in the ICU with uh, life-threatening disease. And yet I'm on the phone talking to their household loved ones um, who were clearly close, close, in close contact with their, 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 you know, their sick family member, and, and yet they had nothing. Now, as Don mentioned, there's a, dif there's a distinction between being infected and having little to no symptoms, what we call the asymptomatic infected person. And, and you know, th that's certainly a phenomenon that uh, we do need to better understand. And of course, now we have people who are infected, but because they were immunized or vaccinated, well, they have very little symptoms or, or you know, non-life-threatening disease. And again, th that that's a different uh, kettle of fish uh, altogether. What we're trying to f figure out uh, is even something more upstream, is that th there's, there are people, including uh, now, who remain uh, 
unvaccinated, and yet they are definitely exposed to people who are uh, microbiologically confirmed to have been infected with COVID, yet themselves have undergone tests, either through PCR or rapid antigen tests, that are consistently negative, and they have done, in fact, consistently done so throughout the pandemic. And so these people are truly resistant, um, and what we want to do is understand that a little bit more. All right, Matthew, I'm going to pad that definition a little bit more as well when we talk about this no COVID cohort. When we're talking about people who are COVID resistant or COVID immune, what do we mean exactly? Is there a distinction even within that terminology as well? Yeah, I mean, I think so. So as um, Dr. Bowdish and Dr. Vin alluded to, there are sort of two types of resistance that, that we think about in the context of infectious diseases. The first type, which is extraordinarily rare, is individuals who by and large tend to have rare genetic mutations that lead them to never get an infection, even if they're highly exposed. Um, we know of people like this in the context of HIV, in the context of malaria, but they're an extraordinarily rare segment of the population. There are then individuals who are resistant to perhaps developing symptoms because of the fact that they have underlying um, immunity in some way that leads them to not experience illness despite the fact that others who um, they may be in close contact with become uh, noticeably ill. Don, I want to follow up on that, uh, looking at some other factors. Lifestyle. This is something that pre-pandemic was spoken about, you know, who would be at risk, who should we protect when we talk about the most vulnerable in our population. Is lifestyle a factor in preventing certain people from getting sick? Well, if you mean, like, can you eat something that miraculously will make you healthy? Is there a vitamin you can take? Then absolutely not. Uh, if you mean lifestyle as in, you know, having great masking policies, following good public health and social mis uh, distancing, then absolutely. So I think it's important for people to know that there are very few modifiable factors in lifestyle other than following good public health measures that provide any degree of protection. And uh, I don't think there's been any associations with um, lifestyle. In, on the other hand, we do often think about the mysteries of age. So as you will remember from the earlier phases in the pandemic, kids seem to be miraculously resistant and less likely to transmit. That's changed considerably with Omicron. Um, and then when we looked on the other end of age, we would see that even in the long-term care sectors or places where the burden of disease was so, so high, you'd hear these incredible stories of resilience of people who didn't get sick despite everyone else or the 102-year-old who recovered from COVID. So in that sense, there are lessons learned from the stages of life about what having specific immune experience in those older adults might mean, or what having a sort of blank and open slate from the immune system's perspective in children means. That's something we can sort of attribute to the stages of life, but I wouldn't say there's any association with um, health, diet, exercise, those sorts of things. Donald, on that note, uh, you know, we talk about age. Are there any other certain demographic groups that are more likely to be quote unquote COVID resistant? So well, that's a that's a great question. And just to go back to the fact that I think we have a lot to learn from um, the, our different cohorts, as Don just mentioned, particularly the elderly. And what we've come to realize, at least for COVID, is if we remember back to the first waves, um, that, 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 that the demographic cohort that was essentially slaughtered uh, with the first waves in COVID were the elderly, and particularly the elderly male. Uh, at the time, our understanding was essentially rudimentary, uh, if not speculative, that maybe they had an old immune system or something to that effect. But we and others uh, have collaborated to, to identify that, in fact, the elderly, but particularly elderly male, have uh, have what we call autoantibodies that actually neutralize their response to a, a molecule of the immune system called type 1 interferon. And as a result, that is at least a, a one contributing factor to to why they get life-threatening disease. 
Uh, on the other hand, what you're asking is why are there some other people who are resistant? And in fact, we have an even rarer cohort of people who have actually suffered and survived through two pandemics, both the pandemic flu of 1918 and, of course, the current pandemic. So that puts them at a very you know rare cohort of 104 or so uh, and older. So we're trying to understand the, the molecular and uh, perhaps the genetic reasons for why uh, some of these people tend to be what we call resistant or, or uh, resilient, if you will. But um, but we're still early in that process. Okay, let's talk about uh, research. Donald and Don, you both are working on and leading some research. And I, I want to start with Donald. You're part of an international study looking into why people exposed to COVID haven't gone sick. How would you describe this project and sort of the goals there and where you're at right now? Well, uh, so this is a this consortium is called the COVID Human Genetics Effort. It's uh, led by uh, doctors uh, Jean Laurent Casnova out of the Rockefeller and Helen Sue at the NIH, and uh, we're uh, the Canadian, uh, you know, major site that's collaborating with this group. Uh, in this group, we've actually identified that you know for the for the severe cases, we've we've identified the autoantibodies that I just mentioned, and in a small cohort of people, also they have genetic mutations that impair their ability to fight off the virus, and then that's why they get the severe disease. And so now we're trying to understand the resistance component, um, as we were talking about uh, with our other guests just a few minutes ago. And so what we're trying to do there is is, is recruit, and we're actually recruiting from uh, you know long-term care facilities uh, across the country, also community dwelling people who have who tell us you know we we have proof that we were exposed to people who were infected. Uh, some, some many of them are actually not. Um, properly vaccinated or are at all vaccinated. And so we're, we're, we're contributing to that. And we, we have, um, in this collaboration, we have about a 1,000 people or so that have gone through the various uh, steps that we've defined to make sure that they really are uh, or, you know, have never been infected. They really are what we call COVID naive. And now we're in the process of analyzing the genomic data. I want to pick a COVID naive. Is that what you said? Yeah, uh, that's the term that we use, and uh, we don't mean that in any sort of derogatory term. We just mean that they, their, their immune system uh, has not eff effectively seen the virus through immunological tests that we that we run on their on their blood samples. And what exact tests are those? Uh, and, and 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 those are would be very different from the tests that the the sort of the public would have seen so far. Correct. Yeah. So, first, you know, first of all, we're, we're physicians, right? So, uh, as physicians, we speak to the patients and we get a history from them when we find out, okay, well, tell us about the person in your entourage, your, your loved one or your family member who was infected. How sick were they? How exposed were you to them? So, we get all that kind of what we call clinical information. And then we also go for the, what we call their microbiological information. We, find, we ask them to provide us the results of their tests, either PCR tests or rapid antigen tests that demonstrate that, in fact, they were tested and consistently negative. And then after that, we take their blood and we look for um, antibodies that either are related to the virus or to the vaccine or both or to neither. And we also look at their cells and look to see if their cells can recognize COVID. And if, they, of course, they can't recognize COVID, that would also help us uh, support the idea that they have their body really has not uh, been infected with COVID before. All right, Don. Long-term care homes have been the epicenter of the pandemic across this country. Uh, you're doing something similar uh, in terms of looking at the research there. What are you looking for exactly? One of the things we're investigating is the relative role of the different arms of the immune system. We've all heard about antibodies, especially in the context of vaccination. And in general, having high levels of antibody tend to be more pr protective than having low levels of antibodies. Uh, but there's a second arm of the immune system, and that's the cellular arm of the immune system. And what's fascinating about the aging immune system is it comes with decades of immune experience. Uh, we actually have circulating relatives of SARS-CoV-2 called the seasonal coronaviruses. And the infection rates for those viruses are very, very high in long-term care. So one of our hypotheses, based on studies that have been done in other parts of the world, is that some of these people who are resistant may be using that cellular arm of the immune response and may be drawing upon some of that immune memory of those related viruses to help uh, deal with an infection when they see the SARS-CoV-2. And so I think as we're sort of refining, and my colleague, Dr. Miller, I'm sure will expand on this, but as we're refining our understanding of what can protect us, we realize that capturing those cellular 
immune responses may be incredibly important in dealing with a variance of concern and with future variants because there does seem to be a little bit more familiarity between the different types of virus that allows people to pull up those, those immune responses and deal with uh, those future infections. Well, let's bring in the biomedical expert here now. Uh, with all this research that we have here, uh, Matthew, how will this research help in the work that you do? Well, I think one of the things that we're learning uh, as we move our way through this pandemic is indeed um, the sort of nuances of how our immune system protects against this virus. And one of the things that's become increasingly clear, uh, especially over the past several months, is that individuals who have what we call hybrid immunity, meaning that they've been both vaccinated and infected, tend to have the best subsequent protection against getting infected again. Now, the issue with that, of course, is that it is far from optimal to need to become infected with COVID in order to get this really strong immunity. And so what we're doing is leveraging the knowledge about how infections bolster the strength and breadth of the immune response and using that to inform vaccine strategies that are able to accomplish the same thing, but without the need for individuals to get sick first. And we hope that that will give us vaccines that are much more effective than our current vaccines in protecting against variants uh, as as we go forward and as this virus inevitably continues to evolve. Don, uh, Matthew had mentioned it, you know, given, given that most of us are vaccinated, how does this complicate research uh, into COVID resistance? Well, nobody goes into immunology because they like an easy job. So it does complicate these things because now we have to understand the intersection between that vaccine response and some of these pre-existing immune responses or other immune responses. And so we can sort of tailor these uh, experiments a little bit. As an example, we are now finding that one of your best predictors of resistance, if you're uh, if you from Omicron, is the length of time since your last vaccine dose. And so the earlier you are to that vaccine dose, the uh, more likely you are not to catch it if one of your household members or one of the people in your long-term care ward happen to have it. So that's giving us a little bit of insight about just how high these levels of T cells, of antibodies, of different features of the immune response have to be. And although, yes, it certainly complicates things, I wouldn't wish an unvaccinated um, person to come into contact with the virus. So what we do is sort of incorporate, like, like uh, Dr. Miller said, this hybrid immunity, understanding that intersection between pre-existing immune responses, between the constraints of the aging immune response and the vaccine response to try to get a complete picture of what protection looks like. Okay, I want to complicate it a little bit more. Matthew, does it make a difference if someone is vaccinated with an mRNA vaccine opposed to a viral vector one like AstraZeneca? Yeah, so we we again have learned a lot um, just through you know real world experience throughout this pandemic about the different qualities of immune responses that are uh, induced by some of these different vaccine types. Um, we we know historically through um, you know vaccines that have been approved for a long time that of course. All vaccines um, stimulate our immune system in slightly different ways. And so where research is headed now is, is trying to um, leverage the sort of best aspects of all of these different types of vaccines in order to um, produce a set of what, what we would call next generation vaccines um, that, that is capable of providing the most robust protection going forward. Donald, it sounds like the unvaccinated would make a better pool of recruits for this study. Is that is that what I'm getting? Uh, well, if you're talking about the study for for resistors, yeah. So I, you know, in the ideal world, we would uh, I prefer to have people who uh, who don't have vaccine induced immunity. As uh, as was described by both Don and Matt, and so we can uh, naturally we can understand their natural immunity. But again, as mentioned by Don, that is not something that we would recommend. We we in fact I would recommend the contrary. We we all believe that vaccines are helpful. Uh, we all believe that vaccines protect us. They save lives. They decrease hospitalizations. They actually have an impact on transmission as well. So there are all these benefits to vaccines. So we are not in any way advocating that people don't get vaccines. 
vaccines. But at the end of the day, there are people who nonetheless don't get vaccines for whatever personal reasons they have. Um, and those people uh, nonetheless remain exposed. And, um, you know, uh, I, those who believe in contributing to science uh, can do so by, by helping us understand um, if they're resistant and why they're resistant. Matthew, if you were to find a person whose genetics contain some mutation uh, that kept them from getting sick from COVID, how would you then use that information in developing, say, a vaccine? Yeah, great question. It, the answer is that it really depends on the nature of the mutation. So in the context of some other infectious diseases like HIV, for example, where we have examples of individuals who we know are genetically resistant, um, it's sometimes the case that their resistance is a result of mutations in the protein on our cells that the virus binds to and uses to get into the cell. From the standpoint of developing new vaccines, that kind of information isn't particularly useful to us because, of course, we know that if the virus can't bind and enter our cells, it can't infect us. In contrast, though, there are cases where individuals have mutations that lead them to have a fundamentally different quality of their immune response. And understanding how those mutations impact immunity and how that immunity protects against virus can be used in order to guide vaccine design. Now, from vaccines, how about therapeutics? Is there any helpful uh, or benefits from the information there as well, Matthew? Yes, absolutely. So um, viruses really depend on using a lot of the machinery that's present in our cells in order to replicate and ultimately make us sick. And so one uh, really exciting avenue of therapeutic development is trying to identify um, which molecules in our cells the virus disproportionately relies on in order to replicate. And if we can drug those molecules, then we have the possibility of um, being able to prevent viral replication and, and uh, having uh, a new therapeutic capable of treating COVID. Don, you had talked about uh, some of the variants before, and I, I, I'm wondering, could someone be resistant to a particular strain of COVID? For example, maybe they're resistant to Delta, but not Omicron. Absolutely. It looks like Omicron is much more difficult for us to be resistant to, as you've seen by the number of people who, even with the very best vaccine immunity, are still able to get sick. So, so uh, certainly changes in uh, the virus itself lead to changes in this. And again, you know, using children as a great example, in the early phase of the pandemic, we learned uh, that there were some features of children and young people that made their upper respiratory tract a little bit less uh, resistant to getting infected in the first place. And that just simply isn't the case in the context of Omicron. And so this is an evolving field where we have to understand the context of the variant as well uh, in providing some of this natural resistance. Uh, similarly, we, we have also learned that some of the antiviral mechanisms, as uh, Dr. Miller referred to, that are essential for this do have changes in their expression with, with age and uh, um, uh, with sex. So men seem to have um, be more susceptible than women. And as a consequence, we have to incorporate our understanding of this into studies looking at transmission. And sometimes this also means that we have to break down what question are we asking. Are we asking about people who are resistant to any infection, asymptomatic or symptomatic? Are we asking questions about are they resistant to just symptomatic infection or severe disease? And in truth, there are different arms of the immune system that tackle all those different questions. And so that also is a really important distinction that we need to understand. Just want to follow up on that note. Uh, why are men more susceptible? Men, historically, uh, and perhaps surprisingly to, to many people, have always been more susceptible to respiratory infections and poor outcomes. Part of that is they have really strong uh, inflammatory responses. And in the context of the lung, a strong inflammatory response that allows all those immune systems to leave your blood and enter the lung uh, also allows the liquid in your blood to enter the lungs, hence pneumonia. So they've always had this association with uh, you know, pandemic influenza, with uh, other uh, bacteria 
bacterial pneumonias and with COVID-19. And as we heard earlier, there's also this increase in these um, anti-interferon antibodies uh, that seem to be a little bit higher in men than, than women, meaning that they're more likely to get these, these infections through their upper respiratory tract. And there are some genetic mutations, very, very rare, that are encoded on the X chromosome. So women get two copies. So if you have one bad copy, you can make it up with the other one. Um, men, unfortunately, only have one copy. So if they have one of these mutations, uh, that means that they are much more susceptible to these poor outcomes. Donald, I want to uh, take a step back and, and talk variants again. As Don said, evolving. We're here in our sixth wave. Your study is international. How will you account for all of the variants um, emerging down the road and, and everything in between? Well, we're certainly, you know, uh, tabulating all that information. We uh, we do have uh, the genomic data, not just of the humans who get sick, but of the viruses that are uh, infecting uh, most of these humans. So, depending on the countries, we have most of that data. Um, and of course, as as uh, as you alluded to before, you know, there is a possibility of what we call a graded resistance. Uh, in other words, you may have been resistant to some of the original circulating variants, uh, but perhaps less so to uh, to the to the more recent ones. In other words, you're resistant up into a certain wave and then after that you got infected and again that very well may be genetic as well but it may be genetic due to a, a, a due to a, a variant in your own gene that is perhaps uh, not, not as uh, as impactful or powerful as certain other uh, variants in in other people so so we're, we're definitely incorporating that information um, we're also incorporating again as, as all the other epidemiological risk factors that you've mentioned so age sex I think Don alluded that to very quickly very, very uh, accurately, which is that, you know, the, the X chromosome is a harbinger of a lot of immune genes. Um, and if you are born with only one, which is what m the majority of males have, um, you that is the baggage for the rest of your life. Um, and so, you know, uh, that, that does play a role. Of course, there are what we call epigenetic phenomena that we're also looking into. And um, so we're trying to address all of these components and in integrating them into what we call sort of uh, complicated mathematical models or bioinformatics analysis to, to understand it. All right, I'm hoping we can do a little bit of a history lesson here and look back at some other diseases that we could uh, learn from. Don, uh, COVID is obviously not the first disease where people exposed to it weren't affected. We, we talked about um, HIV. Uh, are there other examples that we can, that we can learn from and, and pull from? Absolutely. In fact, it's a, a phenomenally rich area for understanding natural resistance. A classic example is the sickle cell gene is associated with resistance for malaria. The changes that come to those red blood cells make the parasite a little bit less able to, to reproduce, and so that leads to some protection. There's been associations with the genes that cause cystic fibrosis and other diarrheal diseases, as an example. Uh, and of course, the Black Plague, which decimated uh, the Northern Europe population, has left a number of genes associated with uh, resistance to that that have changed a little bit of the immune response in people of uh, European and, and Asian descent. So there's a very rich history of doing sort of genetic archaeology or uh, immunology archaeology to understand how these pandemics have enriched for some of these genes. Uh, and genetic diversity is where humans are the most diverse. We need to have a range of different genes uh, to help us deal with future and emerging infections. We always want to have some part of the population uh, resistant, but as a consequence for some of that variation, we also find that some of these populations may be resistant to an infection, but more likely to have another uh, poor outcome, sickle cell being an example of that. Immunology, archaeology, I like that a lot. Uh, Matthew, I'm going to come to you. This is uh, maybe not so long ago, but a well-known case in Kenya. There were a group of uh, sex workers found to be immune to HIV despite repeated exposure. To what extent did that discovery lead to better treatment uh, for HIV? Well, I think that um, whenever you can find markers of resistance against, uh, you know, really devastating infectious diseases, it's it's extraordinarily important because it tells us about um, features that the virus is absolutely reliant on. Um, and when we know what those features are, it's it's possible to develop um, therapies that, that target those. So in the context of HIV, obviously we have uh, highly active retroviral therapy. That, that therapy has really changed the paradigm around what living with HIV looks like. People who, uh, you know, 
take heart by and large live you know healthy average lifespans now and that is at least in part uh based on our understanding of what these really essential things are uh, that the virus needs to to replicate in people. So um, these these studies are very challenging. Um, uh, they require huge numbers of people, but it's always a worthwhile endeavor because we can find some very surprising things that can then um, you know, lead to major discoveries as it relates to either vaccines or therapeutic development. Speaking of discoveries, Donald, I want to check in with you. What stage are you at with your research and sort of what are the next steps going forward in the last few minutes that we have here? Well, for the the resistance uh, project that we're, we're talking about here, we're, we're in the process of, uh, you know, um, what we call vetting or triaging the the genomic candidates. What that means is that of the people that we have uh, defined through what we mentioned before, the clinical, the microbiological, and the immunological tests that look like they are resistant by and large to uh, COVID up to now, uh, we've already done what we call uh, next generation sequencing or whole genome sequencing of those patients. Uh, we have uh, done what we call the bioinformatics to uh, to get down to a candidate list of genes. Uh, and now we're in the process of doing the molecular biology to determine which of those, uh, you know, genes or genetic variants um, provide resistance, at least in our experimental uh, um, setups. So we're hoping that within the next uh, about four months or so, we'll have a, a more concrete or robust uh, molecular understanding, at least of some of these uh, individuals. And Don, I'm curious to know from your perspective, what would a success or a breakthrough uh, look like in terms of the research, not only the, the research that you're doing in long-term care homes, but in COVID resistors in general? For me, it's all about the next generation of vaccine design. I think it, once we understand which arms of the immune resistant uh, immune system are variant resistant, you know, which ones will protect us against variants with, with mutations, then harnessing that and putting that into those next generation vaccines is really essential. And this is one of the things I'm, I'm most excited about. We're also really learning that having the antibodies at the right place at the right time prevents infections. So whenever we measure antibodies from people, we generally measure them in the blood. Antibodies in the blood are very important. They can prevent death, they can prevent hospitalization, but having uh, antibodies in your nose, in your mouth, all those places where the virus enters seems to be really key in stopping infection. This is what we call mucosal immunity because the mucus or the wet parts of your body are where very special antibodies are. And so for me, learning about the relative importance and how to harness and improve this to stop uh, infections in their tracks before they even get started would be an enormous win for our community. I am curious, uh, since both of you are leading uh, research projects, uh, I know that, uh, Don, most of yours is in long-term care homes, but Donald, I, I wanted to follow up on that uh, earlier uh, answer that you had. If people wanted to get involved, uh, are you still looking and how do they, how do they take part? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, science is, is a partnership, right? It's not just a, a, a bunch of scientists sitting in their labs being nerds in silos. So what we actually want is we want collaboration not only among scientists and not only within a country, but internationally, but also with the public. So if the public hears this and says, you know what, I that's me, uh, you know, please uh, feel free to reach out. We, we've, we've, we've had numerous uh, emails, somewhere around uh, 400 or so emails of people contacting us and saying, I think I fall into your category. Um, the, please contact us. We will walk you through the, the, the investigations or what we call the criteria that we have set up. Uh, and if you're eligible for that study, great. And if you're eligible for another study, but not necessarily the resistance one, we'll offer you an opportunity to participate in that as, as well. So the, the, the only way we're going to get out of this pandemic is if everybody does their part. Uh, the scientists are trying to do ours, but we're trying to understand the public. So the public, if you can certainly contribute, we would be very open to that. Matthew, with the lead of, you know, physicians, doctors, scientists, and the public taking part in all of this, how will this research help us prevent future pandemics? I'm looking beyond. Yeah, well, I think one thing that we've learned is that, um, you know, every every dollar we spend on prevention, um, you know, is comes back a, a hundredfold. Uh, and so, 
one of the things that I hope we learn from this pandemic is the need to get out in front of infectious disease threats. We were extremely fortunate to witness what's essentially a medical miracle in the rate uh, uh, of approval and the overall effectiveness of this first generation of COVID-19 vaccines that, that people um, have been getting over the course of, of the last uh you know, 18 months or so. Um, however, despite that medical miracle, we've still witnessed millions and millions of deaths. And so what I think we really need to do is to be more proactive and forward thinking when it comes to the way that we prepare for infectious disease threats going forward. And very small investments in in prevention really pay off um, given the the massive not only economic but public health tolls that we've experienced uh, over the course of the last two and a half years or so. We are going to leave it there. Donald, Don, Matthew, thank you so much for all of your insights and for all of your work. Thank you for joining us on the program tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You're not wrong if when you think professional basketball player, you picture someone tall, maybe even super tall. But standing at 5'3", Tyrone Muggsy Bogues held his own on the court over his 14-season career in the NBA, including time with the Toronto Raptors. His memoir is just out. It's called Muggsy, My Life from a Kid in the Projects to the Godfather of Small Ball. And Muggsy Bogues joins us now from Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome to the program, sir. Oh, thanks for having me. All right, so we're going to start off with uh, the nickname, because I think a lot of people don't even realize it's actually not your name. Uh, it's Tyrone is your first name. But uh, how did Muggsy come about, and, and it, it, how did it stick? Well, you know, growing up in the inner city of Baltimore, where I grew up at, um, you know, playing out there in the streets and trying to, you know, I think any kid at that time is going to get some sort of nickname. And for me, you know, it was the way I played the game of basketball. I was stealing the ball from a lot of the guys that I played against, and they was talking about I was mugging everybody. And then at the same time, we should have a show come on every Saturday called the Bowery Boys. And one of the characters happened to be, his name was Muggsy. And of course, he was the smallest amongst this uh, crowd that he was hanging out with. And they kind of tied his character, the way I played the game of basketball. And I've been Muggsy Bogues ever since I've been seven. Sounds like a much better nickname than uh, what your family called you as a kid. Tell us about that. It was Apple, correct? Yeah, yeah, I almost had Apple there for quite some time. You know, at early age, uh, when I was one, two years old, even three, four, five, I used to keep a close, shiny hair, uh, shiny, uh, close cut, and, and it always kind of looked like a little shiny Apple. So my, 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 my family always called me Apple, but Muggsy overcame that. You know, once it became uh, a place to find me. <laughs> you you grew up in the projects of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, during a time of high unemployment uh, and a crack epidemic. How did you not get caught up in all of that? I know, you know, in your memoir, you talk about sort of that impact that it had on your family firsthand, but you managed to sort of stay out of that. Well, yeah, me and my best friend, Reggie Williams, you know, kept each other focused on, on the craft that we was trying to pursue, which was a hobby at the time. You know, basketball was a means of possibly, you know, just going to college and making something better out of your life. And that was how far we was thinking at that particular time. And we're so thankful for Mr. Howard. You know, Mr. Howard back then was a director at the recreation center, but the one that really taught us the game of basketball and it's still a vision that we didn't think that ever existed. So having that understanding and having that fortitude in terms of being able to see beyond and wanting something better for us as well as our family, you know, that kept us focused. And basketball was a safe haven for us to try to, you know, elude some of the things that was going on in our neighborhood. Let's talk, uh, you talk about, uh, you know, one of your first coaches. I want to talk about another coach, uh, Bob Wade, and your historic high school run there. And I want to start with what I think is one of the most unusual drills. I know you've talked about this before, but what does a masonry brick and sandbags have to do with basketball? Well, you know, the bricks, coach got creative. We didn't have fancy equipment back in our neighborhood. So we used to do our defensive slides with our bricks. We ran our sore side with our bricks. We did our jumper jack with our bricks. The sandbags as well on the back of our backs. 
um, because he was a former professional football player and he had those understanding how to get out mentally focused as opposed to not just thinking about the game. So, I mean, that was, that was a means of us training and I'm glad that it, it worked because, you know, we wouldn't have been able to go 59-0 for two seats. Well, let's talk about that, those two seasons. This is probably and arguably the best high school team to ever play uh, uh, basketball. Uh, what was so special about that team? Obviously, you had some good friends on that team as well. You had some good coaching and some, and, you know, the bricks as well. So uh, tell me, what was so special about that squad? It was so special because we all was talented. I mean, not only just four of us, we had 11, 15 guys was fortunate enough to get Division One scholarships. And four of us was was able to go all the way to the NBA, and three got drafted in the same draft in the first round, which made history, which something probably would never be uh, done again. So that's how special that team was. You know, myself, the late Reggie Lewis, who played for the Boston Celtics, David Wingate, along with Reggie Williams. A great squad. I actually want to pull up a photo. Uh, this is from your time at Wake Forest. This is from 1983. You are somehow skirting through the court between John Sally and Vaughn Joseph right here uh, against uh, Georgia Tech. You would ultimately spend four years at, at Wake Forest, but your freshman year, that was a difficult one for you. What were some of the, the biggest adjustments uh, coming from Baltimore to, uh, to Wake Forest? Well, one, it was a culture shock, but I knew what I was getting myself into because I selected Wake Forest, especially once I took my visit. But I knew it was going to be a challenge uh, coming from the inner city and going to a predominantly white school. Um, but I needed that challenge and I was, you know, welcomed it uh, co-heartedly. Um, playing time was was difficult. You know, I was accustomed to playing the entire game mostly. And then here it is, she was coming in, playing behind a great player, Danny Young, understand that once again, understood the situation. But just my competitive nature, you know, wanted to take over and wanted to be out on the basketball court. And but then after, you know, we had success um, during the NCAA run, after it was all said, uh, after it was over with, um, I was accused of being cheat, uh, cheating on the test, which didn't take place, didn't happen. So, you know, facing that type of adversity, you know, being that you was placed with some sort of, you know, racial uh, component, the first time I was, was put in a situation in that regards, uh, where racially was uh, basically right in your face where someone didn't even want you, you know, at the university because of the, the color of your skin. And, um, but after overcoming that and putting it in a proper perspective and still willing, willing to stay there to get my degree to finish it all, and I, which I'm so thankful I did, um, because, you know, when you face with adversity, you know, for me, when my back against the wall, I'm always ready to come out swinging. You know, I want to talk sort of about the, the recruiting process. Uh, young players these days have the luxury of the internet. They can put a mixtape out there and, you know, uh, and, you know, recruits and scouts can look at that. That wasn't the case necessarily for you. You had to go to all the combines. You had to go to any sort of place where someone would be, would look at you and be like, hey, you know what, that guy who's five foot three can ball. Um, even with strong, you know, showings during high school and in college, do you think NBA coaches and scouts had a hard time getting over your height? Absolutely. I mean, it was a challenge each level. I mean, they still, you know, was believing that I had the skill set, but no one was willing to take that chance. You know, it was like, no, nah, you know, he can play, but maybe not for us and maybe not on this level. I can't take that chance. And I'm so thankful for Coach Tacey was willing to take that chance and allow me to be able to to be able to run that program, which was the top program in the ACC, was one of the touch for conference out there. But being able to, you know, put myself in a position to where I was able to represent, you know, our country in the USA uh, game, going over in the Goodwill and winning the gold medal, being one of the last collegiate teams to do so. I mean, that kind of also, I think, gave the uh, professional scouts or coaches, you know, probably an inquisitive mind of thinking that may be so, you know, but after I came back from the combines and went scared Scotty Pippen myself, had performed so well there. Our stock had rose, and we was put in a position uh, in the light to where now these guys should be considered being one of the top high drafters out of our draft. I want to talk about a team that uh, took a chance on you, the Washington Bullets at the time. They drafted you 12th overall, 1987 draft. And I want to show a photo. This is a photo that I think a lot of people who don't even follow basketball will recognize. In this photo, you are standing beside the late Minute Bowl, who stood seven feet, seven inches. You have huge respect for him, but what was it about this photo that you didn't like too much? 
No, I love this photo. This <laughs> is one of my favorite photos. I mean, that was my guy. You know, Medina. I mean, normally we had three balls where they show uh, stacked up. Um, but I think what, ha what uh, people was probably misconstrued what I said in terms of what the Washington Bullets was trying to do during that time when he and I was there, trying to all of a sudden later part of the season, trying to make it like it was a novelty act, trying to allure fans to the arena to come in just to see a big and the tall, the, the, the tallest player in the league and the shortest player in the league and trying to use it in that regards. But we was comfortable in that own skin. We knew what our skill set brought to the table. Uh, but I like to say, I know I love that picture. That was my, one of my favorite photos that I love taking. It's an iconic photo for sure. All right, yeah. I wanna show uh, a short snippet of your game because I think that's really where some of that magic uh, is best showcased. So let's have a look, uh, a short clip of your game. 541, the tumble against Wolf, Muggsy Bog, to kick pocket. Trying to screen on him, but you can see he is gonna stay up. He thought he got pushed off. Muggsy's annoying in many ways, Mark. Muggsy stole it from Smith. Muggsy Bogues is a pest. Is sort of, uh, sort of, is sort of what I what I get from there. You know, there were other short uh, players in the NBA. When we look at Spud Webb, we look at Earl Boykins, but they had a scorer's mentality. Your game was a little different. How would you describe yours? Well, that was that true natural, you know, throwback type of point guard. You know, pass first. I uh, like to make my teammates better. Uh, running my team um, and taking the opportunities when they presented themselves. Uh, and having that understanding, you know, allowed me to keep climbing up the ladder. Defensively was something that I, I laid my hat on, you know, trying to make my opponent work, especially getting the ball across half court because as a point guard, that's where it all starts, getting your team into your offense as quickly as you possibly can. Um, so, you know, being that, as you mentioned, uh, being a pest, that was something I relished of being because that of me allowed those guys to think about me at all time, especially once I was on the floor. Should mention that you still rank in the top 25 in the NBA in assists, and you were a leader in the assist to turnover ratio in the league. So you definitely, uh, you know, kept the ball with you at all times. I want to talk about uh, your time in Charlotte. I want to pull up a photo here. This was a, a few years after. This is in 1992. Uh, you shooting over Patrick Ewing and Charles Smith. Uh, you would later go on to face them at the, in the playoffs that year. I don't know what happened after this shot, but it's a great shot. Um, <laughs> I'm, cu I'm curious, you know, you spent 10 of your 14 years in the NBA with the Charlotte Hornets. What was it like getting on the ground floor of an expansion team? Oh, yeah, my time in Charlotte, I mean, it was very special. You know, being able to come here as an expansion team, knowing that this was the opportunity I could kind of restart my career after being drafted so high by the Washington Bullets, you being disappointed and let go. But, you know, myself and Del Curry, we had that same mindset that this was the best place for us in terms of being able to become, you know, the players that we wanted to become in the league. And it, you know, even though it took us a little time in terms of, getting play, accumulating players. But once we started to get the, you know, the, the top players, the Larry Johnson, the Lonzo Morning, we became a national household team and we a lot of people start to follow. So I want to pull up that photo that you probably just saw there. That's you and Del Curry, uh, but not Charlotte. We're talking the Toronto yeah. Raptors. You would spend the last years of your career with the Toronto Raptors. What was it about this team that you found appealing, especially when others weren't interested in playing here? Because you, unlike other players, you signed here. You didn't get traded here. This is you made a conscious decision. What was it about this team? I know Dell had a huge uh, had a huge reason in, in you signing as well. Tell us about the the backstory there. Well, actually, uh, at the plant in Toronto, and then watching, especially when they had Vince and, Ter and Tracy, um, you knew that it was an up and coming team. And then when they acquired guys like Charles Oakley, Antonio Davis, and you start saying, you know, the mixture that they were trying to put together. But Butch Carter, after doing the offseason, Butch Carter came to Charlotte and he kind of recruited me. And he was recruit actually recruited Dell and myself and um, told us about the situation that in Toronto and, and, and wanted some veteran leadership around some of the young guys. And for me, you know, that was a match made in heaven because having that type of athleticism and the type of uh, toughness that Oakley brought as well as Antonio and then Doug Christie been there as well. I mean, that was something that I was felt like I can be supportive of, but I also can lend, you know, my talent to where I can contribute. 
and thankful it came into a fruition because we was fortunate enough to make the playoff that very first year um, that we was there. Tell me about the luxury it is to play with not only in Charlotte, you talk about, you know, you got Larry Johnson, you got Lonzo Mourning, and then here you come and you're playing with Vince Carter and Trace McGrady as a point guard. Your lob skills, like, that must have been amazing. What, what, tell me about that. I mean, it was amazing. And again, like I said, having them guys, especially when they was young, you know, <laughs> they were so athletic and they were so hungry about being the player they want to become. And, uh, and, but they was well, you know, guys that was willing to listen. And that's what I loved about them. They was not two guys that had egos out the, out the roof. They was guys that understood the veterans that came along that could teach them and mold them in a way that they need to be molded. And they allowed us to do that for them. And we just relished in that role. And they became, and they led us, you know, to that first year of being able to, to make the playoffs, which not many people even gave us, you know, kudos of doing, you know, because it was uh, so young in terms of being in the league. You know, it was only in the league for what, 95, five years in existence. So mm -hmm. being able to, to make the playoff within that fifth year was something special. I don't think a lot of people know this, but you have long-term plans with the Raptors organization. You had inked a four-year deal, uh, but tragedy struck in your family. But, um, you know, tell me about sort of that mindset long-term. You were sort of on the, the latter half of your career, of a veteran in, in that. Where did you see your role uh, going forward with the Raptors organization after inking that deal? Well, I love the organization. I love the country. I love the fans. I love what they was building. And that was something special. And you always wanted to be part of something at the beginning, something special that could possibly turn to something great, which actually happened, you know, in 2019. So um, those are the things that, you know, they, they had set, you know, a high bar and you wanted to be part of it. And, but unfortunately, like you said, things, you know, ended abruptly. Um, in a way that I didn't want it to, but you know, like I say, think God has a plan that we don't see at times, and that was His plan within for us, as far as the my concern. Uh, but I would love to have been with the organization for a long period of time, uh, and being able to contribute in, in many fashions, coaching wise or in the community or whatever that may be. But you know, that was something that I was willing to, you know, to look and be part of. Uh, but it, unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. I want to talk about sort of what your NBA career uh, did for you off the court as well. It seemed like the NBA uh, opened a number of ventures, including several appearances in movies. I think I was talking to some uh, some colleagues earlier today. I was like, Bugsy Bogues, Space Jam. I was like, yes, 100%. But he's got a number of other credits to his name. You you know, you were doing all the cameos, Saturday Night Live, Curb Your Enthusiasm. What was it like being a star on the court? but off the court and in Hollywood. And did you get any trash talking because of it on the court? No, no trash talking. I'm just amazed that a kid from the projects all of a sudden wound up, winding up on different sites of screen sets, <laughs> you know, the basketball screen and then all of a sudden the movie screen. But I'm just so thankful and grateful that I had those opportunities that was presented to me. You know, being in Space Jam, no one ever even thought that it would be such an iconic movie. And then being able to have an opportunity to do Saturday Night Live with Charles Barkley, I mean, that was, you know, that it wasn't even a dream to come true, but it was just a dream that just even happened for me that, you know, opportunity to present it. And I mean, Richard Lewis and, and Larry David, I mean, they had hilarious. They had me laughing the entire time on the set. And it was so I'm so grateful for that. And working with Miss Whoopi Goldberg and Eddie, you know, it was a lot of opportunity that I had off the screen and Anthony Davis before he even got started. And, uh, hang time. So it, I'm just thankful and blessed and blessed that, you know, these opportunities presented and I had a great time while I was doing it. Are you working on anything that we should expect? <laughs> well, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin anything. Uh, it's possibly a, a Muggsy Bose project could be in the, in the works, but, uh, that's something that we're working on right now. Very nice. I want to talk a little bit about uh, small ball and the future of basketball. Uh, Golden State Warriors Stephen Curry uh, wrote the foreword of the book. Of course, he is the son of Del Curry. How much of an influence did you have on his game? Well, I tell, let Steph tell you, I had a, quite a bit of influence on him. You know, as a kid, yeah, I think he just looked at if he felt like if he could get 5 3, he felt like he can make the pros. You know, so that's that was his standard. You know, when he was a kid, he figured that that was automatic if he get the 5-3. So I changed the perception of what people thought about size-wise of how they can make it in terms of the NBA. Um, but, you know, just, I guess, him watching me in terms of being small and overcoming so many obstacles 
and being able to be successful in doing it. Um, he got to witness that and him looked upon as small, even though height wise, he's six, two, um, <laughs> structurally, you know, his, his weight and that sort of thing was always small and they looked at him in that regards. So he had to carry the same type of, uh, noise that I was hearing to overcome and, uh, and seeing him to be at this level, I mean, to be considered one of the best or uh, the greatest shooter that ever laced them up. I mean, it's mind boggling for me. Um, I'm just grateful to be here to be witnesses and to be a testimony to see that, you know, him, not only his him and Seth as well, the things that they've done on the basketball court. Both will be going to the postseason, so that is some great stuff. I am curious, you know, when we talk about small ball, things have changed a little bit from sort of when the Golden State Warriors sort of implemented, you know, a, a smaller lineup. You know this firsthand. If you look at the Charlotte Hornets, you look at the point guard there, LaMelo Ball, standing at 6'8". At the Toronto Raptors, if you look at it, there is no position. We, it's a very positionless uh, basketball team. Uh, where do you see sort of the game of basketball, and how do you see yourself fitting in it? Let's say, I've, I asked this question to Charles Oakley when we had him on the program uh, a few months back, but, uh, you know, how would you do in this era of basketball? Well, I'm quite sure any NBA player who played in the league feel like they could play in any era. That's just the confidence and the cockiness that we have within ourselves. But as far as for me in this era, you know, you looked at the skill set that I've that I've, uh, I've I possessed. You know, this has been a perfect time. I mean, you think about it, nobody could hand check you. I mean, I was pretty quick, so I'm quite sure I'd get around anybody. And the lane is wide open. There's no one camping in the lane like they once did when we played. And we got so many shooters around. I mean, we got shooters for I mean out the woodwork. So I think I could probably average about 20, about 15 or 16 assists. Uh, at least about 15 points because, again, like I said, the game is wide open. Nobody can foul you and nobody could um, get up on you. And then as far as defensively, a lot of guys drove the ball too high for me. So <laughs> I've, I've been quite a bit on that still in as well. Well, it seems like both uh, you and Dell Curry need to come out of retirement and uh, get back into the game. I want to thank you so much for taking the time chatting with me today. Thank you for this opportunity. That is the agenda for Monday, May 2nd, 2022. As day one of the Ontario election approaches, tomorrow we'll see what the party's advertising strategies reveal so far about what their wider campaigns might look like. I'm Jane Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. TVO.org has a brand new look online for the latest Ontario current affairs from our digital team, from the agenda, of course, and for all of our podcast documentaries and programs, check out the slick new website at TVO.org. <laughs>